Hi everyone, um, I will start um, by presenting uh, the association. This is a talk uh, in cooperation with the DSSG, so Data Science for Social Good. And, um, oops, let me just take... Sorry, I was just taking the sound so that I cannot hear myself. Um, so this is a, a collaboration between the SSG and NILG AI. Um, the SSG stands for Data Science for Social Goods Portugal. And basically we are a non-profit organization that we intend to put together beneficiaries that can be charities, ONGs or public administration with volunteers. And volunteers can be from different types, data scientists, data enthusiastic, developers, designs, and even domain experts for their own projects. And putting these two parts together, we create projects. And these projects are intend to be simple, yet impactful. We want to give deliverables that will really make an impact on the beneficiaries that are with us. Normally, uh, these projects, we try to make them around three, to six months, so a medium duration. Um, in the past, we concluded one project. The project was uh, in, with uh, Rotarac Santo Tirso, the Liga Portuguesa contra o Cancro. And in this project, we did an exploratory analysis of the data regarding the national fundraising against cancer. And the goal was to provide a report so that uh, in future decisions, they could optimize the fundraising campaigns. Because imagine, for example, that maybe in a supermarket at this um, time of the day, it will be more profitable, so people can raise more money than, for example, being on the street. Right now, we have uh, an uh, ongoing project with uh, AZP, 
Associação Zófila Portuguesa. And here we focus on the reducing the waiting time for clients in scheduling appointments and treatments. And basically we are going to, to make two deliverables and one of them, and we hope that they will use and would be useful for the future is a dashboard where they can see all kinds of data from the past and see which days they have lower um, uh, animals, clients, and how they, ca they can schedule better in order to fully optimize their human resources and their infrastructure. Also ongoing, we have a project with CAIS. Associate CAIS, as probably you already know, have uh, one of their main way of uh, raising money is through the sale of uh, magazine CAIS. And we are analyzing, making this analysis on the income distribution of the sellers over the year. So they just may, they just turn 25 years this year. So we hope that aggregating all the data and analyzing, we can truly make a storytelling for communicating their impact while raising awareness and help them in future campaigns. The next project that we hope to start pretty soon is with Frutafeia. Frutafeia is a, also an ONG. They raise awareness for a fruit that maybe it's a little bit, um, not ugly, but different from the standard that we see in the supermarkets, but completely good, good and nutritious. So that food should also be eaten. And we try to optimize the process of the food basket deliverable. So to see which um, fruit or vegetables should be in a, a certain basket for that week and how we could organize the whole process in order also to make the best gain for this association. But we need your help to make this happen. And how can you help us? You can help us in several different forms. So we can, you can help us in the project itself, like those that I was just explaining. So be part of a data science team to help these ONGs, these non-profit and charities to increase their social impact. And you can go to our website and to check the upcoming project. For, for example, this about uh, Fruta Feia, you can be part of that. We also have what we call the mini project. This is a small team working independently in a concrete short-term initiative. And we started this with um, the repository that we made for um, COVID-19. But we hope that we can launch other uh, similar initiatives with other topics that are also important, but they don't depend directly on the ONG. So they are shorter, they have smaller teams, but they still make a huge impact and in data, data science for, for social good. And then we have events. You can take part in our meetups that right now it's not possible to do that those physically, but you can also take part of the talks like the ones that we are doing right now and you are watching and workshops for data science that we hope that will grow and grow in the future. And you can be data for a good ambassador. So to, bri to bridge the gap between us and your organization. For example, if you know an organization or if you're part that, and you can um, get data or ideas, we know a project or we have this data, maybe it could be useful to you, please talk with us. And how can you support us? Support, you can also do it in several different forms. So we can start with the tech partner, so sharing tech, and this could be, for example, if you are in a company and you have cloud servers where you can run models or data visualization solutions, and you can offer, for example, a subscription, something like that, you can talk with us, uh, be event partners, for example, supporting us with venues or coffee break service when those will be possible in the future. In future, you can be data partners sharing the data, for example, similar to what I was uh, saying, imagine that you have data that you think is going to be useful somehow in a, in a project. It's also very, very valuable. Uh, knowledge partners, for example, workshops, training and talks, or you can be a project patronage. And this, you can also help um, with money, so uh, with financial support or with other kinds of initiatives. 
Please follow us in all our social media. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and if you know any other social media that we should also be, please talk. Or if you have a comment or question or just to share a thought, don't hesitate. Also, we, you will have our email at hello.dssg.pt. And right now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Calvin Fernandes. He is the founder and CEO of New AI, this amazing partner that we have and we do talks with. And he's going to talk with us about uh, using AI to design a more efficient keyboard for ILES patients and one very particular ILES patient. So if you can share your screen and... Okay, thank you, Katarina. Let me know when you can see my screen. I think I'm already sharing it. Uh, yep. You can see it now? Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you for the for the introduction. Um, we started this project, uh, I think, in July. Uh, so it's a very recent project, but we already achieved some interesting results and we and by we i mean Millie, I and also anthony uh, we wanted to share these results with the community to get new ideas to to see any interested party um, participating on this so i think it's quite relevant to bring it uh, to the to the data science community uh, for social good so i would like to start about anthony about and about als I think uh, probably you know ALS from the ice bucket challenges, but probably you don't know the reality of ALS patients. So I think uh, Anthony is the best person to talk about it. Um, I will show a, a video, it's, it's, it's cropped, but then I suggest you to go to, to Anthony's uh, YouTube channel because he has a lot of amazing videos about, about this. Um, so I will ask you for a few minutes just to, to, to see the video, to watch the video. Sorry. Let me know if you can hear the, the audio, uh, please. Okay, that was probably the most embarrassing thing that I've ever done in my entire life, and holy shit, that was pretty crazy, right? So why did I do it? Uh, I've been so terrified of ALS my entire life because it runs in my family. ALS runs in my family. My, my, my grandmother had it. She was the second mother to me. My mother was diagnosed when I was in high school. And uh, five months ago, I was diagnosed at 26 years old. ALS is so, so scary. You have no idea. so challenging to watch, it's so challenging to see and to talk about. Nobody wants to see a depressing person that's dying and has two to five years to live. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want their day ruined. People are getting frustrated about seeing the ALS size budget challenge right now, and that's fine, that's fine. That means our, um, you know, our awareness is working. It wouldn't be successful if we weren't um, irritating a few people, right? Uh, I promise. Your news feed will go back to cat videos and let it go cover. So right now, the ALS community has has the main spotlight. And for once in my entire life, I've seen it in the forefront. There's not very much incentive for the pharmaceutical companies to invest the billions of dollars it takes to develop a drug because I'm not profitable. I'm not worth saving. Right now, my hands are starting to ash free away. They're getting weak having trouble starting my car, buttoning my shirt, 
Eventually, I won't be able to use my arms or hands at all. Eventually, I won't be able to walk, talk, and breathe on my own. And that's the real truth of what ALS is. It's devastating. It's costly. It's not profitable. This video is all over the place with emotions, and I am... Um, you know, I apologize for my rant and for my tears, but if I don't, if I simply dump ice in my head, I don't think you're really going to get the point. And so I thank you for sharing this video in advance. This is the first successful advocacy we've ever really, really, really had. And I am so, so, so grateful. You have no idea how every single challenge makes me feel, lifts my spirits, lifts every single ALS patient's spirits. You're really, truly making a difference. And we're so, so, so grateful. So I will move forward, but I, I, I actually, uh, I will suggest you to, to watch all his videos. I think it's amazing. Um, so now you know a little bit more about ALS, and at least more than the, just the ice bucket challenge, you know, the reality that people with ALS live every day. And, and Anthony, I, I think it's a very special case of a patient with ALS because, so he was a, a he is a still a, a photographer, but he, he was a photographer even before having ALS. And he has been working very hard, uh, you know, hacking the daily, uh, daily objects, daily use objects uh, for, for improving the way he, he interacts with them as uh, uh, over, as he this is, uh, changes his, his capabilities. So he started, you know, uh, by building uh, this structure just to keep the camera uh, lift as he walks. Uh, this was uh, an initial project that you can see on his social networks. Then he attached the camera to the wheelchair and had like the structure and the comments uh, just to, to be able to interact with the camera. Um, in an easy manner. This was a very recent project that he, he published on his uh, social media about using this camera stabil stabilizer. Probably you, you have seen them, like the ones that even if you shake the, the, the handler, the camera stays very stable. So he adapted this to the wheelchair so his head uh, gets super stable and yet it absorbs kind of the, the shaking um, movements uh, from from the streets so this you can also watch this video on, on his instagram it's, i think it's super clever it's a super clever idea and and he also triggered this project about the designing a new keyboard layout to minimize the the writing efforts uh, for als patients now at this point uh, anthony has a new idea for a feeding tube and he's looking for experts in, in materials and product design uh, to contribute to the project. So I know there are a few bioengineers in the audience. So if you are interested in, in collaborating with Anthony, please send him a, a message. Uh, he, is, he is super open for collaboration. So I will, I will challenge you to, to think, to help, to, to help him with this project. And stay tuned. I mean, Anthony is always like bringing new ideas and new projects to change the way uh, people with ALS and other uh, mobility restrictions interact um, in, in, in our work, right? So um, let's begin with the project. Um, and I think the best person to describe the challenge and to motivate why, why, we, why Anthony started this challenge is Anthony himself. So he brought us a, a message, a synthesized message. Uh, from himself, so. Hello everyone. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today and your interest in helping the disabled community through technology. My name is Anthony Carbajal and I am a designer and photographer despite or because of an inherited neurological disease called ALS. This condition progressively deteriorates my motor neurons until I can no longer move, breathe or speak on my own. Thankfully, this disease does not take away my ability to feel, see, or problem solve beyond my physical limitations. I was diagnosed in 2014 when I was 26 years old and when I was a caregiver for my mother who also has ALS. 
average life expectancy is three to five years after diagnosis. However, with love and innovative adaptive technology, my mother is still alive 19 years later. She communicates with me using an eye-tracking computer and has her own synthesized voice similar to this one. Our family embraces technology as it's the closest thing we have to a cure. Although this disease ultimately causes us to be locked in our body, most of us retain eye movement and rely on eye-tracking technology to type and therefore communicate. The only downside is, typing with our eyes can be extremely slow, tiresome, and can dramatically hinder our ability to have meaningful conversations with those we love. Often, my mother doesn't talk, because she says her eyes are just too tired. We use keyboards that are designed for able-bodied fingers that we no longer have the ability to move. And so our eyes dance around the screen on a keyboard that's not designed for us. This is why I began designing a new modern keyboard layout with eye movement as the main design priority rather than finger placement, because I truly believe that we can do better. Even if it's a slight improvement, I believe that it's worth all the effort. But I quickly realized I was in over my head. With 26 characters alone, there are more layout possibilities than there are grains of sand on planet Earth. How would I alone identify the best keyboard? This is why I seek the help of Kelwin Fernandez, who is the head of an artificial intelligence company to help me solve a seemingly unsolvable problem, and to help me build an algorithm to calculate the optimal eye-tracking keyboard layout for the entire ALS community. He and his team have generated exciting and meaningful results that he will share with you shortly in detail. We are simply looking for fresh eyes, feedback, and new ideas around this specialized keyboard. I am so grateful you chose to join this webinar to learn and help us solve the unsolvable. Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you everyone for your valuable time, meaningful work and consideration. Okay, so with those initial great words, words let's start uh, with the challenge. So Anthony designed like an, a new keyboard layout. So you are super used to the QWERTY layout where you can use like your 10 fingers at the same time. I mean, you don't even need to see the to, to see the, the keyboard to, to type and you can type super quickly. But if you think about, you know, moving your eyes to track every key, I mean, they are super far away, especially like common combinations, like try to write, I don't know, ING, which is a typical ending of a word in your keyboard, you will need to travel a long distance from I to N to from N to G. So Anthony designed this uh, this initial keyboard. It's like an hexagonal, uh, it's based on hexagonal patterns. Um, and the challenge is here, how can we like, you know, shuffle these keys just to optimize the, posi the positioning to so he can just travel the minimum the minimum distance. Uh, so as as Anthony said, there are way more. I, I did the math, and there were more combinations of this keyboard than grains of sand in, in the in the planet Earth. And so it's a super hard problem. So how can we use data uh, to tackle this problem? Is is the first question. So this is what we basically did. It's basically three steps. First, we got like a huge amount of uh, text, uh, I mean, free text in, in English because Anthony uh, speaks in English, but we could also get like a different, I don't know, data set for Spanish or for Portuguese or whatever. Um, so we cleaned this text. Um, of course, there, there are some challenges ahead like should we use a general corpus corpus or a domain specific corpus for the type of language that Anthony use, uh, uses? This is an open question that we will try to solve next. But well, let's say we start with, with this amazing corpus of data. And then we try to understand what are the typical transitions between each, each pair of um, characters. So how many times do I move from A to B and from B to K and so on. So we learn kind of this transition ma matrix. And in this way, we know which are the transitions that we should optimize uh, with higher priority, right? So basically in the end, uh, we just need to, to provide this to, a, to an optimization algorithm to, to assign the right positions um, to the keyboard. 
Of course, here we are think we are talking about a fixed layout layout structure, and we are only changing the positioning of the keys. If we move to an upper layout where you can have keys with multiple sizes and spacing between them, the 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 search space is, is actually infinite. So here we are just talking about permutations of the keys, and, and the plugin is still huge enough to be super interesting from an AI point of view. As you can see here, this is a problem we are not solving uh, with machine learning, which is kind of super trendy. We are solving it with classical AI, so with search, uh, with um, with optimization, with, with combinatorial search. Um, but I think it's still super interesting, and I will just take a few minutes just to you know to explain a few meta heuristics. I think it's nice. It's a nice piece of knowledge for for data scientists. Um, so what is a meta heuristic? Basically, a meta heuristic is just a a recipe to build good solution or good enough solutions uh, to an optimization problem. So a few details here. It's a general recipe. It's not like uh, something that you will use once. So it's something that you can reproduce in multiple problems and you can adapt and adjust to, to different problems. Good enough is a super relevant thing here. So we don't want the best keyboard because that will take probably thousands and thousands of years. We want a keyboard that is better than what we have now. We will be happy with that because it's already an improvement. I prefer to have an improvement today rather than the best solution in, in, in a thousand years. Okay, and of course we are we are talking about an, an optimization problem. So when should we use meta heuristics instead of just going with the traditional optimization tasks, uh, or or I don't know with a traditional algorithm that doesn't do any search? Basically, when you have uh, too many potential solutions, let's say exponential or infinite solutions in the same in the problem space. Uh, when you don't know a way or an exact method to solve it, let's say you know how to compute a, a shortest path, okay? And that is a solved problem. You don't need to use meta heuristics to solve that. But you don't know what is the best permutation for this keyboard. There's not a, a known algorithm in, that runs in polynomial time. So uh, this is this is okay for using it. And so when you are in a rush, so you don't, you don't have 2,000, uh, 200,000 years to wait for a solution, okay? You need a solution in a couple of days. Okay, so in this scenario, you should go with meta heuristics. So how you should how you can use uh, this type of algorithms, you need to define an, an objective function, let's say maximization or minimization function, and you need to decide what is the representation of your solution. So, and this will define kind of the search space of, of potential solutions for you. In this case, for instance, our our representation was the, the permutation of the of the of the keys of the, of the characters. Here, you need to decide a, a couple of things, such as will you allow infeasible solutions, for instance, solutions without a key or with two keys of the same character? Um, do you, are you covering all the potential solutions, or does your representation uh, misses some some potential solutions? Um, also, you need to, to think about if, if your representation is efficient enough, enough to compute the objective function because you will need to compute it thousands of times uh, when you run this. And then you will need to define some domain-specific operations, and I will illustrate in this talk how you can do that, at least for this one, okay? And so some categorization of these type of, of algorithms. You have a trajectory-based uh, meta heuristics where you take an initial solution and you, ser you search around it for improvements of that, of that solution, for instance. And here you have local search, iterated local search, variable neighborhood search, table search, simulated annealing. This is super famous, so probably you already knew it from, from your courses or something. So in this case, we have an initial solution and we go, you know, shaking this solution and doing changes to the solution until uh, uh, and improving the solution uh, epoch by epoch. Then you have constructive meta heuristics, where you build the solution for a scratch, from a scratch, adding parts of it on each step. So think about the first one. The first one trajectory base will be you begin with a keyboard already with all the characters, and then you start scrambling the, the keyboard just to get new ones. In this constructive, you will begin with an empty keyboard, and you will be putting like 
the keys one by one, looking for, for a good solution. And then you have population-based solutions, uh, meta heuristics, where you take that, like a bunch of proposed keyboards, in this case of proposed optimization uh, solutions for the optimization tasks, and then you get, wow, you know, mixing all the potential solutions and combining them and taking the best from, from each one. Uh, and in this case, you have, for instance, genetic algorithms, okay? So you, you probably already heard about genetic algorithms. This is a case of population-based uh, meta heuristics. Um, and then, of course, you can get creative, and people get very creative with meta heuristics, and you can, like, build hybrid meta heuristics, or you kind of combine a populational base with a trajectory base. Actually, this is what we did in this project. I will show you then the results, but basically we combine a genetic algorithm just to get, you know, just to explore a lot for an initial good solution. And then for the best solution, we applied a trajectory based meta heuristic just to optimize the last bit of, of that solution. But I will show you uh, how to do this. So we need to define the objective function, okay, for, for this ALS keyboard, what, what are we optimizing? In this case, we are optimizing uh, and this is something we decided, it's something that we, we should challenge, yeah, if this is the proper, the proper metric to optimize. We are optimizing the expected cost uh, of writing a large corpus of text using the proposed keyboard layout. And by cost, we mean the Euclidean distance between the keys, okay? We are not sure this is the right um, function to optimize because eye move movements may not be, you know, uh, equally costly. So maybe you need to put a lot of effort going uh, upwards in your eyes, but not so much uh, in a sideways um, direction. Maybe let's say moving from here to the corner to the corner is easier than just moving internally. Uh, so it's not clear that the, that the cost is proportional to the to the directly proportional to the um, to the uh, distance. But we took this assumption, okay, and this is some, that, that is something that we are challenging uh, right now if, if this is okay or not. Um, so we, we are thinking about ways to adjusting the distance for personalized costs and understanding that this specific patient like has a, has to invest a lot of effort for doing this type of movement, while this type of other movement is super easy for him. So this is something that we need, we still need to embed in the algorithm. Um, I just, okay. Then we need to uh, decide the representation of, of, the, of the keyboard just to, to have, you know, a discrete way of optimizing uh, the keyboard. And in this case, we just use, you know, a, a clockwise uh, traverse, and I mean, a clockwise uh, path of all these, all these keys. So, this is the first one, an array, then we are going with this, then we are going with this here, and then with this. So the problem now is just finding a permutation of the keys, okay? So we have an array where we say in the first position, so this one, we have an N, then we have an I here, then an L and G and so on. So the problem translates to a very well-known optimization problem uh, and with very well-known uh, operators for, for shuffling and, and playing with these uh, with these solutions, which is permutation based operators. Okay. And so I will describe first local search, which is the easiest one of the of the meta heuristic. I will say it's just a heuristic, not a meta heuristic, but well, but you will you will if you are from data science, you will feel related with this algorithm. So in local search, what we do is we have this search space. Of course it's not linear in, in our cases hyper-dimensional, okay? But let's say it's linear, we, don't, we are only optimizing a, a variable, let's say, and then we have this cost function that we want to minimize, in our case, the distance, okay? Of course, this function is not super well behaved, so we have some local minima, and we need ways to, uh, of avoiding those, those local optima, okay? So in local search, what we do is that we define a neighborhood, okay? And we check the neighbors for a better, so to find a better solution, okay? So between these two, we realize that this one is better because it minimizes the, the cost function. And if you have seen this before, it's super close to gradient descent, right? In gradient descent, you move towards the direction that minimizes uh, 
the cost function, the only thing that makes gradient descent different from local search is that you know the direction to improve the function. In this case, you don't know the direction, so you need to explore uh, all the neighborhood and then get in the best solution. Okay, so you do this like multiple times and you repeat this until convergence, okay? Until you find a local mean. And this is local search, okay? Super easy. You just change a few things in your solution, move to the direction that improves the most the, um, the solution, and then you iterate until you until the time is, is gone or <clears throat> until, uh, until you find a local minimum. But as I said, this, I mean, this is a not well-behaved optimization function, so you need to be able to get the solution out of local minima, and for this, you have iterated local search. And here, what you do is, once you find a local minima, you just shake the solution to escape that local minima, okay, and to move to another part of this uh, optimization function. Of course, you could go like to other regions here that won't help, but let's say your new solution is here, and then you can repeat the local search process until you reach convergence, okay? And in this very beautiful case, you'll reach your your global optima, but of course, you in a, in, a, in a real life run, you need to do this a lot of times, okay? So this is iterated local search. It's a trajectory-based algorithm. Um, for the operators, in this case of, of the ALS keyboard, um, we, this, we use this, uh, so swapping keys. At each point, we swap every potential pair of keys, uh, let's say this one with this one, and we verified if the, if the cost improve or not. And for the perturbation in the, in the iterated local search, we just did random shuffling of a subset of the keys, you know, just to avoid local optimas and, and see if the solution improve uh, from there. So now let's move to genetic algorithms, which probably most of you or some of you know, but I think it's super nice to, to discuss it here. In genetic algorithms, you get a bunch of random solutions, let's say, uh, and on, on each generation, what you do is crossover. So you kind of mix, uh, let's say, the fittest solution, the most, the best two solutions that you have. Of course, this is not deterministic. This is something you do like uh, in a probabilistic way, but let's say, these two are very well uh, solutions that want to cross over themselves. Um, so you mix some parts of each, each solution to get a uh, new offspring, okay? To get new, new, new children, okay? And to find uh, new potential solutions. Of course, these children, this off offspring will have some parts of each good parent, okay? And we will hope for uh, having better kids than their parents, okay? Uh, in this case, in the for the ALS keyboard, what we did is is single point order crossover. You can find the reference later if you want, but basically it's like this. So we have the two parents. We get a part of this parent, let's say this block, and then the first ch child will have the same part of the, of the parent, and then the remaining keys will appear in a pretty close order of yeah, of the second parent. For instance, if we have this, parent one is nil dot dia, and we have this single, this point, this crossover point. So the first kid will have nil, the same, the first parent, and then the remaining characters in the same order, they appear in the second parent. And the other one will be the, the, the opposite, okay? There are many ways of splitting these. We use the, the concentric rings. So one parent will bring the interior part and the other one will bring the, the exterior. But you could also do, you know, like a random shuffling of, of the, a random mask of the points. You could kind of put lines here and say, well, the parent will, this one parent will provide the left side and the other one the right side, whatever. So this is something to tweak and to play with. Um, then you add the solutions to the population, but of course, before adding them, uh, sometimes mutations happen, okay? So this is like evolution, okay? If you have read evolution, you have the, the fittest one uh, mate, okay? And they have kids, and these kids, if they are better adapted to the, to the life, to, to the challenges of life, they survive, but sometimes mutation happens, so you, you stop 
new stuff uh, get included in the population. And let's say the, the, the new kid is not exactly like the needs of the parents, but it, it brings something new to the population, okay? And in our case, the, the, the mutation was the same operator we use for the iterated local search. So we just shuffle part of the, of the keys, okay? Um, so I will jump to some results. Um, we use, as I said, a, a hybrid metaheuristic, a genetic algorithm to get a good initial pool of random uh, solutions. Once we converge to a very good solution, we move to iterated local search that tries to optimize this final solution. This is the final keyboard that we found. It has some very nice patterns, such as the caps is right after the space, okay? Uh, because caps always typically goes in the at the beginning of words. Um, then we have patterns such as WH for WH questions. And, and if you look to your keyboard, to your QWERTY keyboard, W and H are super far away from each other. So you, it will cost a lot to, to write a question uh, with your eyes. Also, there are uh, interesting patterns such as THE or THI. Uh, this is another super interesting pattern, ING for the ending of verbs, um, as well as EN, and um, ND. Also, dot enter. So you write a dot and then an enter. If you see your keyboard, the dot is not that close to the enter. And so you can see here the effect of optimizing the, the keyboard. Um, when, so we also try to compare these with, with other baselines, with other keyboards, just to know if we were actually optimizing something or, or if the cost was the same. If we compare our keyboard, against the QWERTY keyboard, you will have, so you will need more than twice the amount of time to write the same keys with your, so the, the distance between the keys will be uh, two times larger, 2.2 times larger, okay? So it's a major optimization versus uh, QWERTY, okay? But of course the QWERTY was not optimized for this. So what we did is we took the QWERTY, uh, the QWERTY keyboard and we applied the same method heuristics to change the position of the keys. And in this case, the, the world, so we could optimize the, the QWERTY keyboard distribution, but we're changing the position to a factor of 1.33 times more than our best solution. And so here you can realize that like hexagonal keyboards are better for this than, than these square uh, patterns uh, for, for the QWERTY like keyboard. Of course, we, we guarantee that the sizes of the key of the keys were the same in the two cases. So we were not just you know compressing the keyboard; it, they had the same size uh, per key. Um, and then if we compare this with with the keyboard that was designed manually by Anthony, it, it had 15% more effort uh, than the optimized one. So when we compare these two, we are talking about a 15% uh, improvement. Okay, when we compare with the quality, it's like a major improvement is 2.2 uh, improvement. Um, so next steps. Uh, so we want to optimize uh, for, for user specific vocabulary. So we don't want to optimize for general English. We want to optimize for each individual patient. So if this patient says a lot, hi, how are you? This will, should be, you know, super core for our optimization. If this patient says Anthony, because it's his name. So Anthony should be easy to write. And, and also to other languages, okay? I mean, the code is there, but we need to find a good corpus and retrain the algorithms. Um, then we need to, of course, to, to adapt this uh, to the final interface, the eye tracking interface, and there are other institutions involved here. We should also consider a personalized cost uh, by measuring you know, the time it takes to this individual patient to move from one point to the other. So we are not optimizing for the general case, but for this specific patient and the, the constraints he may have in terms of mobility or in terms of I don't know, the difficulty of, of reaching one part of the, of the screen with his eyes. Um, so if, in case you want to contribute, uh, here you have two options. We are together with the SSG uh, in their summit we are organizing a competition for you to optimize and bring your own solutions for the keyboard. The, the registration is open already. You don't need to know programming for this. 
it, of course, you will have to do it manually if you if you don't know programming, but you can also submit your best potential solution for this and say, well, I think this pattern, this keyboard is super nice uh, for this case. So you you will be able to do that and participate even if you don't know how to how to code. Okay. So basically this the, the challenge is finding new layouts. Uh, we will have specific rules and, and we will be updating them for the next three or four days in our GitHub. But I challenge you to participate with there will be a um, a symbolic monetary price in case that changes something between not participating and participating. There will be a price for for the best solution. We will have a jury uh, as well, and of course you will have all the talks from the Data Science for Social Good Summit, which I think it will be great by looking at the speakers. And we will have a Slack to you know to discuss solutions, and so I think it will be a super nice experience. So I challenge you all to participate here, and of course follow Anthony to stay updated about his new hacks. And also, if you want to donate uh, to to Anthony and to the, or to any ALS institution, I also encourage you to do that. Um, some acknowledgments for the people that participated in this project. Of course, Anthony, which uh, was the the driver of this project, and he proposed the project. And he, he he has followed the project very closely. Also, to to two of my colleagues, Paulo Maya and Francisco Morgado, that also participated in this in this project as well. So that's all from my end. Uh, let's move to the questions. Hi, thank you so much. I think it, it was a, an amazing talk uh, from every point. Like um, I personally didn't know about genetic algorithms, so it was super useful for data scientists. The cause is like, it's great. And um, we don't have, a, don't have a lot of time, but I was just pointing it out that in the comments there was a there was a French uh, patient that already asked uh, if uh, the keyboard was specific to English. It was answered, but uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, when do you think uh, this will be available for other languages, and uh, if um, you are you are muted. Yeah. So the keyboard at this point it was in English and. It's kind of easy for us now to translate it to other languages because I mean the polling super generic is just finding a new layout, uh, a new sorry corpus of text, and this is something that we plan to do in the next few months. You know, updating it for, for other uh, languages, but also for a specific persons. And I think this will be a major improvement. So if we have let's say a corpus of emails yeah. from this person of chat from this person. Can we actually optimize for the domain of this person is, instead of for the general, uh, you know, in yeah, yeah. For sure, that will make a difference. Yeah. I also have some questions of my own, but I will go through the comments uh, first. So um, I think you already answered, but maybe you can talk a little bit again. So uh, uh, Hector is asking, as a program, I would like to collaborate with you. Is there any way to collaborate with this project? Maybe yeah. it's with uh, you So we will have this competition in, in October. I think it will be the best way to collaborate because you won't be collaborating with myself or Anthony or only with myself and Anthony, but with the whole um, audience that subscribe to that, that, that register in the competition. So I think the first step will be participating in the in the competition, yeah. Participating, yeah. Um, people are also asking a developer team uh, if there is any uh, installable version of the keyboard available, to available today. Maybe just to yeah, not compare yet. with yeah, the not ideas yet. that just, they already have. Yeah, started this two months ago. We got the initial layout uh, one month ago, and now Anthony is working very closely with. Um, with other companies and institutions to, to implement this in a, in a device uh, for, for them. So they have these eye tracking devices. We need to implement it in, implement it in those devices. Of course, if you, you think you have the right skills to also bring ideas in this part, in the deployment part, and you are more than, than invited to reach us and send us your ideas and to collaborate uh, on this. Yeah. I think related to that, I will just, just jump a question and uh, is asking also if do you work with a specific set of eye trackers? So maybe someone that can really help you to make this. Yeah, uh, this I needed. don't. So we haven't worked still on the implementation part. I, I think Anthony is the best person to to talk about 
Uh, so if you have any question, I, uh, I will redirect you to to Anthony. I think so. He's super active now in this final part of putting this on on the device. So he probably has all these answers. But then you, the same person, also have a question regarding. Yeah. So just the other question is: Do you collect metrics on word per minute yeah. throughput? Uh, so that you compare yeah. contrast with the other I guess keyboards. Yeah, that will be actually the idea that we were talking about, you know, to optimizing for a specific user and not for the general language. To do that, we will need to have live metrics of the usage of that keyboard. You know, whether yeah. are the most common transitions for this user, how much time it takes for him to move from this position, from this specific position to this one. Because even if these two have the same distance for this specific person, might be super different. Uh, cost a uh, workload to move from yeah. one point to the other. So uh, yeah, I think we will for sure need that, uh, you know, just to give the last. Last step, just to really be fine tuned to the person in particular. Um, Ana Patricia Oliveira also asked if this um, project is an open source or if it, it is in a GitHub repository. Yeah, the code is not at this point uh, open source, um, but the code from the competition will be open source, and the solutions Sorry. as well will be open source. Um, in the competition, we will have two parts: one of optimizing this layout, and another one of, you know, discovering a new layout from the scratch. So all those solutions, the idea is to be open source for the entire community to implement later. Yeah. Yeah, that, that uh, is related to the question that I have, because if you, this is all virtual, this is, you are using a screen and then high, eye tracking. So if you allow it to be like a dynamic keyboard, I think that you can really leverage because uh, then you can even have into account the previous words. So not only the pairwise comparisons, or you can even put, if you have sufficient number of words, like an autocomplete, like Google does, or you can take use of a GPTT and just uh, try to guess the next word with a high probability. So you can jump immediately to like two, su two word yeah. suggestions. So this is just ideas for the ones that yeah. really want to put something different. So and go yeah. beyond the, the, the layout that you already have. Yeah, I think that for people with, with ALS, so the cost from moving from one character to the other is so huge that it wouldn't matter if you change the layout at each point just to optimize you know, the, 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 the distance. So if you change the layout at each point just to have the next character right- Closer. You know, exactly, like right on the next position, that will be good for them. Uh, of course, this is these are stuff that we are still thinking about. Yeah. But of course, if you have dynamic keyboards and the keyboard, you know, put like, let's say at least a hint character. Yeah. Like uh, like Netflix does. So Netflix already have like the four next letters. But yeah. I, I truly think that if you go beyond and do like, okay, if my yeah. model is confident enough and I can put like the ink, imagine that you're like playing, you can yeah. really um, improve yeah. the time. Yeah, we but should then validate like, you know, the cognitive cost of changing the whole screen every time yeah. you write something versus uh, speed. But of course, this is something that I will say we need to validate. Uh, I mean, I think it has a lot of potential for reducing the, the, the effort, so. Um, we have, oops, sorry. Just go through the, the right order, or order of the questions. Um, there's a question that it says, this is important for, for point and click typing with an on-screen keyboard. How do we imagine implication on other devices? Yeah, so I think this is super related to the type of cost that we assume in the optimization. So in this case, I assume you are, you know, you can traverse the keyboard from here to here and then do a click. But probably in some devices you need to move, you know, in fixed directions. Let's say up, down, right, left. And in this case, the cost from moving from here to here won't be this distance, but all these yeah. general steps. So depending on the, now we are assuming point and click. Depending on the device, the optimization function will be different. So the cost function will be different and we will need to optimize for that specific device, of course, yeah. Another question is, um, it starts with a comment. So the use of genetic algorithms instead of machine learning is interesting. I also think so. <laughs> is there any specific reason to choose it over uh, machine learning? 
Yeah, so, I mean, machine learning algorithms are, are super great. I, I advocate the usage of ML every time you can. But the issue with the machine learning algorithms in general is that they have a very local view of the of the decision. So they have, let's say, features, and then they you know optimize something like an interpolation of things. They are not that capable of exploring in an efficient way a large search space. So that, that was the reason for using this algorithm. Of course, we should also probably consider like reinforcement learning techniques, you know, to play with changing uh, the keyboard. Maybe that will be a relevant path to follow. But yeah, we felt that genetic algorithms was an easier way of efficiently exploring the search space in a short, in a short time. Yeah. Um, yeah, because like you said, like there's so many uh, solutions, and the optimal solution will probably takes years. To, yeah. to, to develop it is just to have with a, a simple approach and in a couple of months to already improve to the double and more than uh, what the patient already has. It's um, amazing. Yeah, but, and, and we have the challenge. So if you want to participate in the challenge. And we have the challenge to go even further. Learning by solution, I think it will be a great uh, thing. Is the challenge uh, individual or teamwork? Uh, is it, sorry? I think. Is it people uh, put their solutions individually or they can group with other yeah, people yeah. We, and we encourage grouping yeah, just to to the, yeah. Um, we have another question from Julie Freire what are the electronic instrumentation devices used I don't know we haven't reached yet <laughs> this is already from the second phase where yeah. <laughs> the eye tracking will come together and put everything yeah, I think Anthony, maybe I will, I think Anthony is there in the audience. I will challenge uh -huh. them to to publish something about the devices that we are planning to use. He's more... And the eye tracking mm -hmm. device, because yeah. people are really curious about that one as well. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking as well of um, how, um, how long do you think this will be scalable so other patients can use? Uh, how can someone uh, that also speak English, let's start with English because English is what we already have, starts using? Is it easy? Yeah, I think it shouldn't be that hard because, I mean, ALS people already have devices that, for eye tracking uh, and they are already using eye tracking to type, okay, with a QWERTY uh, keyboard. So it's more an interface issue rather than a whole technical issue of how to track eyes and how to, you know, communicate with your eyes. So people is already communicating with their eyes. It's just a matter of adapting the, the user interface. So user I think interface. It's to, to adapt at least the first you know step of getting this general English keyboard into the field, then having specific keyboards and dynamic keyboards uh, as Katarina yeah, said, dynamic, yeah. will be a long-term project or at least a mid-term project that, that will require, of course, a uh, lot of investment probably. Um, but yeah, I think the, the initial solution shouldn't be that hard to, to deploy. I think that if we invest a lot of effort in the next few months, I think it should be possible to adapt a layout, a QWERTY layout for... for well, I hope uh, that someone does that uh, investment because, again, like, it is so useful for for those who need that they should have the solution and it's just a matter of effort and money, of course, because people need to, gain, yeah. to work. Yeah, but but just, everything can be voluntary. I think it's, it's very doable. If we were talking about, we still need to implement the eye tracking and all of this, I will mm -hmm. say a super long-term project with a PhD involved in the middle. But we already have eye tracking, we already have a uh, keyboard. No, it's amazing that they already have a solution so fast and so fast. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, and maybe because I work with uh, NLP, um, what, uh, where did you get the, the data? Uh, so you said that it was not domain specific, but uh, where was it from and how big it was, the corpus? Yeah, I won't say the specific data. So ah, okay. We use it for the competition. Uh, it's an open NLP data set with, okay, about, okay. with, I think, three, between one and three million documents. I don't recall exactly, but it's like three million documents from, uh, Wikipedia, from you, Wikipedia, Wikipedia, et cetera. Yeah, we collected like a lot okay. of text, a general uh, purpose test. There yeah. are a lot of open source corpus, yeah. so I yeah. also encourage people to, uh, yeah. the bigger the corpus, uh, usually <laughs> the high performance. Okay, so I think uh, 
you we, this is just a comment from Anthony himself. I do not have any implementation progress yet, waiting for the finalized solution. So of course the project needs to be phased by step by step. So this was the first step to have a, a layout and uh, optimize layout, and now is the second step. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony, for just clarification. Um, I think we are two minutes actually over time. I think it was really um, a good talk. Like a lot of people were asking questions. I think no, there is none left. I had a lot of them actually written here, but um, maybe we can talk offline or maybe I can even participate in a competition if I have time. I hope that you have. And yeah. so please uh, just, if you have any ideas, shoot to Anthony, to Kelvin, to anyone from the SSG. And um, if you don't have any comment, Calvin, uh, I think uh, we can end the talk here. Yeah, I will emphasize the, the relevance of Anthony in this project. I mean, as you saw, the main improvement was from moving from a square base layout to an hexagonal base, and that was his idea. And he's like always challenges us with uh, new things on, on this challenge, on this problem, and not only on this, but also on other like crazy ideas he gets of yeah. how to optimize other objects. He's super active on this, so I will uh, want yeah, to- Anthony. Yeah, Anthony is thanking everyone, and everyone that was here, everyone that already contributed, and everyone that will contribute in the future. I think, mm -hmm. Anthony, I do not know you personally, but I think you are amazing. Actually, I work in an institute where one of the top specialists in ILS works, here in Lisbon, but he's very famous worldwide. Lisbon Met Carvalho, I don't know if you heard about, maybe Anthony heard. And uh, I saw many, many patients. And truly, if we can make an effort and we can have time, even just with ideas. So you can enter the competition just with ideas. So thinking about the, the, all the designs, so the dynamic, not dynamic. So maybe if I knew how to program, I'll do this and this. Please do it, participate. We can you can really make a difference. And Anthony, thank you for being so um, uh, active in trying to improve uh, your life, the ones that you love, and everyone that has uh, ILS, unfortunately. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see in another talk soon, and um, be safe. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.